Well, before you were born and before televisions were flat, there was this famous television series called The Good Life. Uh, it involved Tom and Barbara, who lived next door to Jerry and Margot. Jerry and Tom worked at the same place until one day Tom flips out. He's had enough. He doesn't want to do the corporate life anymore. So he hands in his resignation and he begins turning his life into one of self-sufficiency and simplicity. The next four series, we just watch these two couples as this Jerry and Margot who enjoy all the luxuries of life. They've got a color television. They've got their food is delivered. The groceries are delivered by a van. They get takeaways. They enjoy parties and holidays and high society moments. They have the best fashion and the best gadgets and they spend their time peering over the fence into the world of Tom and Barbara who have turned their garden into an allotment and buy pigs and chickens and when there's a hole in their socks they they mend them and they make their own decorations for Christmas out of newspaper. It's a program about contentment, it's a program about satisfaction, it's a program about joy because one family are winning the race against all the other rats. The other family have rejected the race completely and on the face of it they have so much less except they have so much more contentment because they've unearthed the truth that it isn't true that more equals joy, that more stuff equals satisfaction, that contentment is bought and purchased off the shelf with the acquisition of things. And it's a lie as we began to look at the other week that I fall for so often. So often I think that I will feel better about myself, I'll feel better about my status and position in society if I just have more. But it doesn't work like that. You know it doesn't work like that. On a really simple level, you know that maybe, maybe you've been trying to watch a film. You sit down and you think, oh, we're going to watch a film tonight. Log on to Netflix or to Amazon or something and you spend longer looking for the film than you do watching the film because there's so much choice. That's the selling point of Amazon or Netflix. There's so, there's more films than you could ever want. There's so much choice. This has to be better than your little DVD collection gathering dust in the corner of the room, right? Or maybe you want a summer read and so you log on to uh, a big website like Amazon and you think, right, great, I'm going to buy a book. Only there's so many books covers to judge that you never feel that you really get one. Oh, maybe I could get that one, oh, but what about that one? Or maybe in your world today, if you were to have a single scoop of vanilla ice cream out of the bottom cupboard of your freezer, you would think, oh, that's a great end to the day. But then you go on holiday and you're on some seaside resort and there's this ice cream parlor and it's got quadruple chocolate, and tiramisu, espresso, lime, mango, vanilla, raspberry ripple, mint choc chip, peanut butter, coconut, Oreo, and Twix, and Kinder Bueno, and you're just mind blown about all these flavors, and it produces this anxiety of decision in you. And, th and then what happens is this, this is what scientists tell us, that actually the having more to choose from doesn't just give us decision paralysis, it reduces pleasure after you've made the decision. You sit on the bench with your two scoops of ice cream and somebody walks past with two different flavors and your mind thinks, ah, oh, I should have gone for that one. Or halfway through the film that you're watching on Netflix, you think, ah, oh, I made the wrong choice. And you stop enjoying the film that you are watching, the book that you are reading, the ice cream that you are eating, and you begin to resent what you have and wish you had something else because greed is a killer of contentment. Now, greed is a funny thing. If I was to say to you, are you a greedy person? You'd probably say no. But contentment is destroyed by greed. Uh, think about two time, two kids that you've had to look after. And child one is really enjoying their life. They're playing with a toy and what they're doing and they're coloring in or something and they're completely oblivious to a toy on the other side of the room until child two comes into the room all happy and picks up that toy on the other side of the room. Immediately, what does child one want? That toy. They never wanted it before, they were oblivious to it, they didn't know it existed, their world was great until somebody else had it and they thought, I want that. Greed just destroyed their levels of contentment. Now, greed is a funny thing. It, it doesn't work like just one big rush it creeps up on you incrementally. It's sneaky, it comes in tiny little stages. I'll give you an example. Last, I've got a house, right? And we left the house last summer and we went on holiday. 
and we caught a ferry one day and the ferry drives out or sails out of this port, this harbour. And as it's going out of this port, it sails past all of these incredible houses, these millionaires' houses. And honestly, I thought the ferry was going to tip over at one point because everybody rushes to that side of the ferry and we're all hanging over the railings going, good night, look at that house. And we're watching as these houses, they've got like swimming pools and infinity pools and jet skis and boats and barbecues bigger than my house. And they've got like multiple layers and it just looks really beautiful. And there's water features in all of the gardens. And somebody along the, the ferry was saying, oh yeah, there's a famous footballer that lives in that one. And oh yeah, that's that director that lives in that one. And we were all gawping at it and taking pictures. Honestly, it didn't give me any trouble. I didn't lose any sleep over that because those were so far out of what I know I can reach that they didn't really spike greed in me. But a couple of weeks later, we go and visit these people and they have just moved into this new house that they've had renovated. And so we go in and they say, hey, what would you like to drink? So I say, oh, that's really kind, thanks, what have you got? Well, they say, you could have, uh, we've got a new coffee machine, so you could have, uh, you know, I can make whatever coffee you want. Or, Paul, we know you love tea, so we could just make your tea, it's really easy. We've got this hot water tap where the boiling water comes out straight away. Or, we've got this uh, chilled fizzy water tap. A chilled fizzy water tap, can you believe that? Press it, chilled fizzy water. I hate fizzy water, can't think of anything worse to drink, I'd rather go without. But, do you know what I was thinking as I drove home from that house? I need a chilled fizzy water tap. Everyone else has got one, they're leaving me behind. I have to get a tap with chilled fizzy water on it and I have to get it fast. <laughs> because it felt like I was sat in a kitchen which was within my reach and these are friends and people that hang around in my social circle, they're not multi-millionaires, and yet they've got a chilled fizzy water tap. That's how greed works, it's just a little bit. I'm totally happy with my car until I go for a drive in your car and you've got this camera that looks behind you when you reverse and all of a sudden my car, which doesn't have a camera, seems rubbish. I'm totally happy on the Zoom call with my headphones until I see your headphones, which are smaller than my headphones and they've got no wires on and they just look cooler and I think, oh, if that's the new normal, I need some new headphones. So. If a life of contentment is the, is the final finished dish that we're after, what are the ingredients that go into that dish? Well, we looked last week at simplicity and just paring back on all of the stuff and just waging war on the desire for more. And I think simplicity helps. I think resisting the empire of more and just accumulating stuff is a really important thing to do. Track back to episode eight if you missed that and how we use Sabbath to resist the empire of more. But generosity, I think, is a key factor in building a life of contentment. If you were to whip out your phone now and do a quick search on your Bible app about thankfulness, you'd find pages and pages of hits from the Bible about thankfulness. But what you'd notice that there, there isn't one that's like this really pithy, zen-like statement, this kind of fortune cookie, tweetable, Confucius-style wisdom that you could just hit in two lines, you know, thankfulness will lead you to peacefulness. That, that, that state, statement doesn't exist. But what does exist all the way through the pages of the Bible is this oozing out of the God people, is this predictable, consistent expression of gratitude and thankfulness. It's almost like a verbal tick that thankfulness just seems to keep coming up and up and up again. Uh, if you look at the Psalms, if you were to read through the Psalms, all the way through there are expressions of worship and gratitude and thankfulness. Repeated over and over again is this one line, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his love endures forever. Ah, what well, a king wrote that you say, of course he feels thankful, he's the king for goodness sake. Well, okay, he wrote some of the Psalms when he was the king, but he wrote some of the Psalms when he was a shepherd boy, before his family was ever picked out and he was ever anointed as king. He wrote some of the Psalms when he was hiding in a cave on the run uh, in fear for his life, he was being hounded by the murderous father of his best mate who's abandoned him. He wrote some of the Psalms about thankfulness then. He wrote some of them after his kids have gone off the rails and destroyed the reputation of his family. He wrote some of them after he's been struck by grief and personal injury. He always writes to give thanks to the Lord. Or 
Paul, if David wrote a whole bunch of the Bible that's in the middle of the Psalms, this guy called Paul writes all these letters which we have towards the end of the Bible and the end of the New Testament. And you can tell if it's Paul writing because every time he starts a letter, he starts with this introduction. It's like, hey, dear whoever he's writing to, I am so thankful every time I think of you. I'm struck by thankfulness. Every time I remember our time together, I give thanks to the Lord for that. Every time I get a letter from you, I'm so thankful. Every time I consider how you are growing and what you're doing in your life and how you are flourishing over there, I'm just watching from over here and writing letters to you, but I'm thankful for what you're doing. He even writes once that he's found the secret to being content and knowing joy and contentfulness in all circumstances. Here's a, here's a guy who's been shipwrecked, who's had to swim and cling on to pieces of driftwood in the ocean for days and try and rescue himself and others. Here's a guy who's been hounded out of town and chased out by a riot, a rioting squad of people who want to take blood. Here's a guy who's under house arrest with a Roman guard and a Roman soldier sat outside his door keeping him in there. Here's a guy who has to wait for years for his trial so that he can experience freedom. And he's able to write about contentment in all of those things. I wonder if there's a link between the thankfulness that he expresses and the contentment that he knows. Or think about Jesus. Has it ever struck you how many times Jesus just give thanks for stuff? As the diary writers, as Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, have they just diary down what they see or what they heard and what they noticed about him it's just obvious that thankfulness oozes out of him every time he's about to feed people he gives thanks first in fact every week we share and celebrate the communion meal this thing jesus started and did you notice that thankfulness is woven throughout that meal he's already said thanks for it right at the start of the meal but then he interrupts the meal and breaks bread and again gives thanks for the bread. And then towards the end of the meal, he lifts up a cup of wine. And again, before he says anything else about what that wine symbolizes, he gives thanks for it. Jesus lives a life of thankfulness. In the Proverbs, it says that the heart is the root of all things. Whatever is in your heart is going to flow out of you. So if your heart is one of bitterness and greed and lacks contentment well then so will your language and your lifestyle but if i have a heart that is joy-filled that is content and is satisfied and is one and is full of thankfulness then that is going to be my language and my lifestyle and so in our discussions this week we're thinking well how is it that i build a life of gratitude if gratitude is the gateway that you enter through to get to contentment and if greed is the diversion that pulls you away from ever entering through that gateway well how do I make sure I go through that gate well here's a couple of things you'll find some more uh, be thankful just maybe start at the end of each day why don't you just note down somewhere on your phone or a piece of paper or a journal or something note down three things that you're thankful for it could be the pillow that your head is about to hit it could be the smell of the takeaway restaurant that you walked past on your daily walk and you're like, oh my goodness, that Southern Fried Chicken smells incredible. I'm so thankful for somebody inventing those herbs and spices. <laughs> it could be the film that you watched that evening. It could be the friend who texts you. It doesn't matter what it is. Find three things that you're thankful for. We did this thing once. We had a thankfulness jar. And every time we were thankful for something, we just noted it down on a piece of paper and we put it in the jar. And then at the end of the year, we had this meal. And as part of the meal, we opened up the jar and we just read through what turned out to be hundreds of things that we were thankful for. Some of them were massive things, you know, like a holiday that we'd been able to go on. Some of them were tiny things like, I just, I'm thankful for the smell of grass after a thunderstorm. And I got to experience that. And I'm thankful that I got a lawn. And what overwhelmed me as I read through these things was just the sheer volume of things that I had to be thankful for. I lived for months off that high. Maybe you could do that. Maybe you could write a thank you note or a thank you letter. Maybe if you've just watched a great film on Netflix, maybe you Google the director and send her a letter and say, thanks so much for making that incredible film. It just made my evening fly past and I enjoyed it or I learned something from it. Maybe... If you know a politician who's done something good, if you can find one, well, write them a letter. If you go for a, a swim in the river as part of your daily exercise and it reminds you that you don't have to worry about your safety when you swim because you know how to swim, but you still know where your old swimming teacher still works, why not write them a letter and say, hey, three decades ago you taught me how to swim. I'm so grateful for that. 
Write somebody a letter and say thanks. Here's one. Eat slowly. Like enjoy the food, savor the food, sit down and look at the plate. And before you dive into it, just take a moment to thank God for all the people that have been involved in the process of your plate. Smell it, enjoy it. Think about how many hands have worked to make sure that you have a delicious meal. Give thanks for it. Don't scan through your socials at the same time, but eat slowly and taste thankfulness. Resist the greed. If you feel yourself getting sucked into the whirlpool of more, maybe just stop, maybe just pause, maybe don't buy it, maybe just leave it in the, in the basket, don't check out yet. And just allow that rush, that adrenaline spike just to go and just question yourself, do I need this? Will that give me the contentment which I seek? One of the great ways to build gratitude is to give. Give away. If you've got to two coats, give one away. And then be thankful that you had enough that you were able to bless somebody else with a fantastic coat and you've still got one that looks great on you. Thanks very much. Maybe if one of the things you wrote on uh, that your thankfulness list was that pillow that's so great when your head sinks into it each night. Maybe give some money to a charity that works with children whose pillows are curb stones because they sleep on the streets and they don't have the same pillow you do. As you become connected with the people who don't enjoy the bounty that you have, then gratitude and satisfaction and contentment are bound to grow. Remember, this is a conversation about growing habits that build attitudes and lives of peacefulness and health and wholeness. We're not looking to churn out thank you cards. We're not looking to just clear all the clutter. That might help. But what we're looking to do is to build lives of contentment. And gratitude, I think, is one of the key recipes for that. So as you're chatting with people this week, you'll come up with more ideas to build gratitude into your life. As you do that, may you be blessed with satisfaction and joy.